while you're finding your spot. We're going to start out in Luke 18, starting with verse 35. We're going to start with a very familiar story to a lot of us about a man sitting alongside the road as Jesus was passing by. Luke doesn't identify him, but Mark does. So Luke chapter 18, verses 35 to 43. It's about a man named Bartimaeus. He is identified as the son of Timaeus. He was sitting by the road begging because he was blind. You know, and it just makes, brings to mind these people who are in these fires in California. They aren't begging, but they are destitute. They are without. They were, they were burned out. And so this man was destitute because he was blind. People in Bible times, if you were blind or lame and you couldn't work, you were reduced to begging for sustenance. And that's what Bartimus was doing. Let's, let's pray, and then we're going to get into this before Palm Sunday message. This is Palm Sunday, and we will get to that. But I wanted to bring in Bartimus because he sees something that a lot of people who are blind, who were not blind, did not see. He was a very astute man. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the scriptures today, for the time that we can celebrate Palm Sunday. The time we can celebrate now as we get into Holy Week, as we call it in the church, Holy Week, the week before your crucifixion happened. And we'll celebrate that next Good Friday and Easter. Lord, as we uh, uh, study this word today in Luke 18, just uh, bring these things to life for us. We want to bring life to the scriptures. They already are life, but we want to bring them to life in our minds, as we can imagine ourselves what it would have been like to be there that day at Palm Sunday. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So, as often, blind or lame people had to do, they, were, they would sit by the roadsides where there's a lot of traffic. A lot of people would go down by, on these routes, or they would sit by the temple gate at the worst time of worship, where people were going in and out of the temple and they would beg for alms. And so that's what Bartimaeus was doing. He was sitting by the roadside because that was where a lot of people went. He couldn't see, but he had very good hearing. And he heard a crowd going by. He heard all the commotion wherever Jesus went. There's always a crowd that followed him and a lot of commotion that happened. You know, people talking, doing different things, asking Jesus questions, whatever. But Jesus was headed towards Jericho, and he heard this commotion. Jesus was at his final trip to Jerusalem. He was headed for the cross. And the scriptures in the Old Testament say that he set his face like flint. In other words, he would not be deterred from going to the cross. He would not be turned Many tried. Satan tried to deter him from the cross. Peter did, tried to deter him from the cross. But he would not be deter, uh, deterred from the cross. He set his face like flint. He was headed for Jerusalem. He knew what was ahead of him. He knew what was waiting for him there. So as he drew near to Jericho, he was on this final trip. There's a man, blind man sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing the crowd go by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is going by. You can almost hear the excitement in the scripture. Jesus of Nazareth is going by. So Bartimus understood something. Medically speaking, there was no hope for him to regain his eyesight. In a lot of things in our culture today, in our time, a lot of eye problems can be fixed, but some cannot be fixed. There are very little hope. In Bartimaeus' day, there was no hope for him to regain his eyesight medically. If you have cataracts, that can be fixed. Sometimes laser surgery is possible for the bleeding in the back of an eye, but Bartimaeus had no other options but begging for sustenance. So when he hears that Jesus is passing by, he knows that Jesus represents his only option to regain his sight. 
That was his only option. As Jesus passes by, he begins to cry out. Now, I want you to pay attention to these words because we're going to come back to them a little later. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's very important, those words that he used. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he cries out time and time again. And those in front of him tried to shut him up. It's like a little kid who's squalling and making too much noise in, in church. He tried to quiet him down. But he wouldn't be quiet. He said, be quiet, be still. And he keeps calling out all the louder. In Mark 10, 49, which is this gospel account of this, another gospel, and Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And the reason I chose to switch to Mark is because they told him, once Jesus said, call him here, and they said, take courage, he's calling for you, get up. And you know what he does? He throws off his cloak and he runs for Jesus. I don't know how he found him, but he ran for Jesus because he couldn't see. But he ran for Jesus, throwing off his cloak. And when they tell him to shut up, he, he just keeps crying out all the more. You know, Jesus cares about the concerns you have in your life today. And we all have concerns, every one of us. There isn't one of us who doesn't have some concern or another. Some of it is medical. We heard lots of medical problems for people that we prayed for this morning. Some of it's financial. Some of it's other things. I don't know what all your concerns are, but Jesus cares. Bartimaeus was on the fringe of society. He was blind. He was lame. He was not a productive member of society. He was people that he was a person that somebody might throw a quarter or a, a denarius or something into his cup. But that's all they thought about him. But Jesus cared ab enough about him to call him there. And Pastor Ireland made the comment on Friday. Friday's Men's Supper, that every day when he wakes up and puts his feet on the floor, and this is good encouragement for all of us, when he puts his feet on the floor, the first thing he wants to do, if I, if I remember his words right, was have fellowship with the Lord. That's the first thing he wants to do. And it would encourage us to do the same, because we were created by God, Arlen said, we were created by God to have fellowship with him. And, he, and Arlen urged us to increase our time of fellowship. You know how it is. We live busy lives. Sometimes we'll mutter a one-sentence prayer instead of spending quality time with the Lord. As we're rushing off to the next meeting and rushing off to this, I'm guilty. As we're rushing off to the various things, we don't spend quality time praying, increasing our fellowship with the Lord. That's why the Lord came to the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day. He desired fellowship with Adam and Eve. As Bartimaeus approached Jesus, Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Here he gives the blind man an opportunity to express his trust in Jesus and Jesus' ability to do what he needs him to do. You know, our prayer times here yeah, that we do, we do them every Sunday and we do them for a reason because we know prayer works. We know that for certain because we see answers to prayer. But it also gives us an opportunity to express our trust in Jesus that he can do what we ask him to do. And that's what Bartimus was going to do. He said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Jesus wants us to be specific in our request for him. We have the freedom to ask him for whatever we need. He says, "Until he told his disciples, until now you have not to ask the Father for anything in my name. Ask and receive that your faith may be made whole. Or made full. When Jesus saw Bartimaeus' faith, he said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus on the way. Jesus always responds to our faith. He always responds to faith. Hebrews 11:6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
For he who comes to him must believe that he exists, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him out. Seek out Jesus. Seek him out. So what did this dude, man do after he was healed? I mean, you can imagine, he was dancing around, leaping. He, I don't know how long he had been blind, but I'm sure he wasn't quiet about it once he was healed. He didn't just walk along after Jesus. He was dancing around and leaping and praising God, kind of like the lame man who was healed when the disciples went up to the temple. He jumped up and leapt around and praised God. I'm sure Bartimaeus was doing the same thing. I would have been doing that. He became a disciple. I bring this story up as a prelude to the Palm Sunday event that is the start of a Holy Week. The Palm Sunday event was a major prophecy in Zechariah. It is about to be fulfilled in the person of Jesus. As Jesus is, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to this Palm Sunday procession that's going to happen. And a major uh, uh, prophecy in Zechariah is about to be fulfilled in Jesus. In Zechariah 9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now Jesus sends his disciples into a village called Bethphage. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, which means a house of unripe figs. That's the name of Bethphage. It means a house of unripe figs. Well, that brings to mind when Jesus cursed the fig tree and it withered from the, from the roots up and amazed his disciples. It was meant to be a lesson on faith for ask in faith believing and God will grant to you. If you say to this mountain, move from here to there, it'll happen. Well, he cursed the fig tree because was, he was hungry and there was no figs on it. But, and, and so it withered. One account says it withered immediately and they came by the next day and they saw it was completely dead and they said, look, Jesus, the tree you cursed is dead. It's withered. But I think it's more to me. It doesn't say this in the Bible, so it's commentary according to Dale. More to me, it shows the lordship of Christ over creation. He is Lord. He is God. He says that if you have faith believing, you can say to this mulberry bush, be uprooted and be planted in the sea. And it would thrive in the midst of the sea. We have faith believing. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he's coming to the capital city of of Israel. He's coming on a donkey. No one had ever ridden on before. On a colt, a small donkey. That's not normally the way a king comes into a city. You usually come on a big white horse. But here he is, the king of the Jews, creator of the universe, the son of God, comes into the, into the city, not on a large horse, on a small donkey. All this was prophesied, of course, in Zechariah. One day, Jesus will come on a big white horse. He will come as a conquering king. But Jesus said of himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to offer himself as a ransom for many. So the question is, Jesus knew as he came into the city uh, that day that he had one week left. One week to live. What would you do if you knew for certain that you only had one week to live? Would you go away on one final trip, take a cruise? Would you go home to see family you hadn't seen in a while? Would you make amends to former friends and family that you were estranged to? Would you do some last-minute repenting? Would you be sad? Would you be angry? Would you be hopeful? Would you be afraid? 
How would you spend those last days and hours? Jesus knew that the time would come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And he washed their feet. He, he served them as the lowest servant of the house, and he washed their feet. Here he is, the co-creator of the universe, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's the creator of the universe. Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, mighty God. What's he doing? He's washing his disciples' feet. He's encouraging them. He's been telling them for, for weeks that he's going to be uh, crucified. And they were very sad. He spent the entire week fulfilling his purpose. He was teaching in a temple. And he did the things that he was supposed to be doing. He was going to offer his life as a ransom for many. Most of us here will have probably many more weeks. Hopefully. Months, years. How will you spend the next week? Will we be fulfilling the, fulfilling the purpose God has for us? Doing that which is most important in light of eternity? Serving Christ and serving others? As we studied in Sunday school this morning, will we exhibit kindness and goodness to other people as part of the fruits of the Spirit? How will we conduct ourselves this week? Maybe even the rest of this day. Jesus chose to spend his time doing the Father's work. As Jesus and the disciples head down the Mount of Olives, a lot of things are going on at the same time as he walks, as they head down. Not only were people there to see Jesus, but John says in his account, and I encourage you to read all the gospel accounts because it's in every one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's different details given in each account about this event. So if you read your Bible, read those different accounts, each one gives it from his own perspective. You know? So John says that they not only came to see Jesus, but Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and they were coming to see him as well. You can read about that in John chapter 11. This was a bona fide miracle that Jesus had done. Secondly, as Jesus rode towards the city, and he looked as he came down off the Mount of Olives and looked towards the city, and if you've seen pictures of that, you can, it's a pretty panoramic scene of Jerusalem. In Luke 19, 41 to 44, it says he wept over it. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that would make for peace but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another within you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So as Jesus enters the city, he's weeping over it. While people are cutting down palm branches, laying cokes on the road, Jesus is weeping for the city because he knows in, in just a few short years this is going to be fulfilled. The Roman general Titus in 70 AD is going to attack the city and destroy it and destroy the temple. Not one stone left on another. But people are having this joyful celebration of Palm Sunday. People are hailing him as king of the Jews. As Jesus entered the city, he goes to the temple and sees all the buying and selling and the money changers and the court of the Gentiles. And he's very angry. It's 22 times recorded in the Bible that Jesus became indignant. He was very indignant. He had a righteous anger. People were buying and selling. They were scalping worshipers who were coming into the temple because the temple money had uh, the Roman money had to be exchanged for temple money because the Jews would not accept Roman money because it had a picture of Caesar on it on the coin so they had to exchange it but they were scalping them charging them exorbitant exorbitant exchange rates and they would sell them sacrificial animals at a very high price so Jesus makes a whip, of course, and he goes about the temple, kicking over the table of the money changers. Money was flying everywhere. Sheep and goats were bleeding. It's just a, a huge commotion that Jesus 
because their doves were flying, goats were bleeding, animals running out the door, you can just admit, put it in your mind's eye. All this commotion is going on. Here's Jesus yelling at the top of his voice, get these things out of here. My house shall be called a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of thieves. That was the only place the Gentiles could pray. Now, you know how much commotion we have in here when we do our meet and greet time. Try to pray. Try to pray during three times that amount of commotion going on. But this was the only place the Gentiles could come and pray. They couldn't go to the court of the Jews. They would be killed. So they had to pray there amongst all this commotion. Jesus says, get these things out of here. My house shall be called a house of prayer. It was quite a lucrative business for the Pharisees and the, and the, religion, and the Sanhedrin. They profited greatly from this, all this business that was going on. So the next day, they come to Jesus and they say, who are you to do this? Tell us by what authority you do these things and who it is that gives you authority. Because they were coming to him and they had seen what he had done and they wanted to kill him, but they were afraid to kill him because the people were hanging on his every word. So they come to him the next day, he's teaching in a temple, and they're, they're asking him, who gave you this authority to do this? So he answers their question with a question. He says, I'll ask you a question. John the Baptist, baptism, was it from God or from men? <laughs> it should have been a no-brainer. They, and they did know their, their Old Testament very well. They should have known that in Isaiah... It was talked about that John the Baptist would come and make straight the pass of the Lord. They should have been able to click the dots right there. But they, they reasoned him amongst themselves. If we say it's from God, they will, he will say, well, why didn't you believe him? If we say it's from man, the people will stone us because they see John as a prophet. So they said, we don't know. Jesus said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority. I do this. And I thought to myself, who, who are, what are these guys thinking about? By what authority? Here he is, the son of God, the owner of the temple, really. The one who instituted temple worship. And they're saying to him, who gave you the authority? He didn't need mankind's authority. He had authority directly from God. He was God. And, and so as they... Look to find a way to destroy him. He dodged their question. He said, neither will I tell you by what authority do I do these things because he needed no one's authority. He's God in the flesh. I'm going to close this message and it's also a question for you. Matthew 16, 13 to 16. Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? You know, that's a question that people are still asking today. Who is this Jesus? Who do people say that he is? That's what Jesus was asking. You'll get ten different answers if you ask ten different people. Who is Jesus? Oh, he's a great man. He was a prophet. He was a good man. He's a lunatic. That's what they were saying about him. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets, and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? This is a question we all must answer for ourselves. Who is Jesus? Is he Lord of my life? Is he my Savior? Is he my Master and Messiah? Peter spoke up. Now, Peter, oftentimes, you know, he went off on something, but Peter got this one right. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you the truth, for now on you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's upon the testimony that we all have about who Jesus is that the church has built today. How the church is being built block by block, person by person today. It's by our testimony of who Jesus is. By your testimony of what Jesus has done for you. He's your Lord, your Savior, your Master, your Messiah. We're still building the church. He said, I'll continue to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Upon a very testimony, that very testimony of Peter had that the church was founded on, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's upon the testimony they would offer a little over a week from Palm Sunday when on Easter morning, they would, they would be astounded by the fact that Jesus had risen from the dead. We saw him alive on the road to Emmaus. We saw him alive. So I leave you with a challenge. Who is Jesus to you? We are created by God to spend time with him. The choice is yours. You can be like the blind be like the blind one who saw clearly who Jesus was, and don't be like the men who were blind that didn't know Jesus as Lord. Read the accounts of Palm Sunday today, deep drink deeply of all the deep details that each one gives you, and then be like Thomas. I'm gonna close with these words who said upon seeing Jesus, now this is a week after the resurrection, and Thomas was in the upper room, and he had said, unless I see him and put my fingers in his nail holes and in my hands in his side, I will not believe he has rose from the dead. And Jesus appeared in the upper room a week later, and, and Thomas was there with all the disciples, and he says, see here, put your finger in my nail holes and your hands in my side. And he knelt down and said, my Lord and my God. Be like Thomas, my Lord and my God. Spend time with him this week. Increase your fellowship with him. He's waiting for you with open arms. He desires that so much. God bless you. Father, as we close this, message off I'm astounded myself how little time that you get of my life you came to earth so that he would open up a path for all of us to have more time more fellowship ask what we need from you and, and be able to receive it there's so many things that you provided for us Lord I'm going to thank you but we give so little time to worship, to have fellowship, to thank you. So Lord, now as we prepare to have our lunch and prepare to have our meeting to follow the Lord, may, may we never forget to increase our fellowship with you. Things in life will get busy and we'll do other things today after we're done here. May we always seek your face in all that we do. May we always worship you. Give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.